you could argue like the best in the world even you know it was really really the standard was so high so my dream was always to get involved with that i guess because of things like netflix and streaming and whatever tv is falling away and i got a 500 pound check i think i was like 24 i'd never been paid i don't think like a, a little thing in that go i'd never got like a big check before but when it first happened i was completely rattled by it and I like didn't know what to do and I forced myself to do some stuff but like I didn't realize at the time like it doesn't matter the audience are gonna enjoy it just make them enjoy it hello all and welcome back to the scouting center podcast I am your host Mr Diz TV and as we move forward into a new phase of the scouting center podcast while football manager will always be its home we are broadening the term of creator and we are having some of the best creators in the world on this podcast that includes content creators, actors, writers, comedians, wrestlers, presenters, hosts, in real life football personalities, and so much more. And in keeping with that, we today, my guest is a stand up comedian, an actor, writer, and a content creator. In his stand up, he was nominated as Best Newcomer at the Edinburgh Fringe in 2016, and he won the Hackney Empire New Act Awards in the same year. He's also won the Joe Online Comedy Awards in 2020. His previous shows include Cakes, Biscuits and Love Butts. As an actor, he starred alongside Emma Thompson, that's Academy Award winning Emma Thompson and Amelia Clark in the feature film Last Christmas. In 2020, when the pandemic struck, he started streaming on Twitch where he became a Twitch partner and currently has over 13 and a half thousand followers. The Scouting Centre podcast is so pleased to have this person on. Thank you so much for being on. It is Bilal Zafar. Bilal, how are you, buddy? Thank you. I'm very, I'm very well. Thanks. Thanks for that nice intro. Now, by all means, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come on to the Scouting Centre podcast. Obviously, there's a lot going on for you at the minute. There's a lot of excitement, isn't there, in relation to your new show that's starting next month? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, it's going to be debuting at the Edinburgh Fringe, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, my new show, I'm going to be doing it for a whole month at the Fringe. It's called Care. And it's all about when I worked in a care home for a year, my first proper job after uni. Uh, but it was a bit of a weird care home because it was like a big, well, it was a big American company, basically, that set up homes here in wealthy parts of the UK because it was quite, it was like very, very expensive to stay in. So it was for wealthy people. It was a bit, a bit odd. And obviously they had people like me on £6.50 an hour. Wow. Keeping the people alive. So that's what it was. So it's It's quite weird, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's what the whole show's about. It's like a yeah stand-up storytelling show. Very funny, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Now, is there some frustration in relation to this show? Because I believe it was initially due to come out around 2020 when the pandemic struck. So is has there been a bit of frustration from your part because you really want to get it out there? Or was it a case of you used that time effectively and you, were, you, you used the delay to your benefit, basically? Well, yeah, I mean, also the way these things work with like Edinburgh shows. So a lot of comedians will do an Edinburgh show like every year, usually. Um, and so you, you end up a bit like when you're at like uni or whatever, or even at school, like you end up doing most of the work towards the end when the pressure's on is when you really start going for it. So it wasn't near. So lockdown hit, it was like March, wasn't it? Yeah, March, 2020. Yeah. So I hadn't really started going for it yet. So it wasn't a finished show at all. It was just the start of it. Initially, very, very frustrating, obviously. Um, apart from just being sad about what was happening in the world with the pandemic. It was like literally that Edinburgh Fringe for me had gone. That's like a thing I was going to work towards the whole year. Uh, or like next six months or whatever. Um, and But also all my gigs as well. Like my only income at that point was from live comedy. And suddenly it was like, that's just not happening. And I never thought that had happen. It's just like, I mean, no one saw like a pandemic coming really. But you just, I just thought I'd always be able to keep gigging. So that was the big, it was terrifying, man, at, at the start. And then luckily um, got on Twitch and that went nicely. Yeah. So, so let's go straight into Twitch then. In relation to oh. your Twitch, what led you to think, right, obviously this massive this massive thing has happened in the pandemic and it's it's destroyed basically all your future plans in relation to stand-up comedy you're obviously you know doing really well you're happy with where you are you feel like you're gonna the nice up the, the upward trend right kind of yeah yeah and then the pandemic happens unfortunately that stops everything why was twitch the route for you 
So I looked at what I could do. So I had to do something online. Like my agent was like, consider like you should write a sitcom now or something, write a script. But I wasn't in any mood. I don't know if, how you felt when lockdown first hit, but it was, it felt horrible, didn't it? Not being allowed to do anything at that point and the whole like queuing up to go in Tesco's and all of that. It was just like, I felt I got really miserable around that time. So I was like, what can I do that's creative? I looked at like things you could do live. And there's th there's that a lot of people were running live like comedy gigs over Zoom, which were nice at the time, but it's not it's not stand up, you know. Mm -hmm. It was like just doing it was like doing a monologue and people were watching. Um, so it was good. That was good for a little bit. But then I was looking at stuff like Instagram Live, which like the quality on it is really bad. Uh, it is, isn't it? The sound and video yeah. is, is shocking. Really, I don't know why it's so popular. Really, I was looking at like the Facebook Live, which I just like. Who is that even for? If you like, except like your cousins, you know, <laughs> who, who, who's watching except like old school friends you've not spoke to in 10 years. Like who, who's going to find you on Facebook live and uh, even like Periscope. I'm not even, I, you know, I've never used Periscope. So I was, I was trying, I was dipping my toe in all these things. And then a friend of mine, Limmy, who is, he's very, very big on Twitch now. He's like a legend anyway. Um, but now Twitch is his like main job. I asked him about it. Like, should I do Twitch? And he said, like, absolutely. He said, go for it. But, and the best advice, he, like, some of the best advice I've ever got, I guess. He said, he said, do Twitch, but he said, don't dip your toe in. Like, I've seen some comedians do. Don't, like, just go on and then leave again. He said, like, really go for it. He said, go, like, head first and, like, put everything into it. And that's what I kind of did. I mean, because there were comedians on there that I saw just doing stand up on Twitch. Just like going through material, not looking at the chat or anything. And it's like, that's not what Twitch is about. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no involvement for the audience there. So, uh, yeah, I played a few games at the start and then um, had the idea of doing the Pez thing where I am the character of the manager with it, which I thought was obvious, honestly. Like, I thought that's a no brainer to do that. And I thought a lot of people would have already done that kind of thing. And I'd just be one of the other people doing it. And it turns out no one had done it. So it's like a nice kind of fluke, I guess. Good timing for me as well. No, no. Sometimes, sometimes that meets opportunity, doesn't it? And and ultimately, that's what ended up happening. What inspired you to do the manager role in Pez? Was there a particular thing that you saw, or, or was it a case of it just popped into your head? Well, it's like so. Actually, what happened was I wanted to play FIFA initially and just have fun playing FIFA, um, but I had a really crap PC um, at the time. And it couldn't, FIFA wouldn't work. So I was like, well, I'd like to play a football game. Pez 5 used to be my favourite. That was like the first, so I'm 30 years old. That yeah. was the first one that I got into, the one with Henri and John Terry on the front. I, you know, that game, so addictive. And doing the Master League on that. Yeah. And designing the kits and all of that stuff was just the best, you know. And I thought, okay, I'll do that. I'll go back into that world. And then I thought, whenever anyone... I, I think whenever someone plays a game like that, you just imagine you are the manager, isn't it? You you kind of imagine doing team talks. You imagine you've got a beef with some other club or something, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's like a huge occasion if you're playing like PSV Eindhoven or something, you know. You make up storylines, basically. And I thought, I'll just do that. And also, you got yourself in the corner of the screen. As soon as you figure out how to do a green screen, the chroma key stuff, it's quite straightforward. Um, and I thought, yeah, I'll just wear top half of a suit and just be the manager and that that was it really and then it's like it kind of it grew from there so initially it was just me and i all i did was change my background to um team talk you know just yeah. the very basic advertising thing and then i just gave like the first player castolo i gave him a voice so i just cut to him and he talked and then we had conversations and then from there I just built more and more characters and then storylines and it's i've done like i've done i think almost 160 yeah, almost 160 of those streams. <laughs> <laughs> but there's obviously it's an crazy. appeal for it because people carry on coming back and, and it's it's really yeah. popular. Becoming a Twitch partner, was that something you initially set out for? Was that a realistic goal for you or was that something that was just neither here or there? Uh, it was nice. I mean, I don't... I, I, don't, I don't really get too excited about these things. It's a bit weird. I know it sounds weird to say because some people would love to be like a Twitch partner, but I was just, at the time it happened, I was just very happy on there. Like, because honestly, I was on such a high for like, it felt like six months or something because I suddenly, like my, my life as a comedian was get offered, uh, do really well in comedy somehow and then get just get offered work around like being Asian or whatever 
which I'm not interested in. A lot of it very cringe, you know. Yeah. Um. So it was like it was like a cycle of that. It was like that kept happening, and then like nothing was quite going my way, and I thought I was never gonna really get anywhere, really. Um. I know, like you read out the little credits and stuff, and it sounds impressive, but it's like actually when it was actually happening, I didn't have a lot of money. You know, I just had a few things going my way. And then suddenly to have Twitch and have a regular monthly income. And the main thing, to be honest, if you're, I guess, creating anything, you want an audience, an active audience that are really into what you're doing. And that's, I had like the best audience, especially like in peak lockdown. I had my, you know, I think everyone's viewers were way up, you know. And I remember I had, when we did our first, we got to the D1 Cup final for the first time. And I had a thousand people watch the whole stream live, which was... I never imagined anything like that. So, yeah, sorry. So, like, I was just quite happy anyway. And then the partner thing is just an added little, you know, having the tick. And uh, I think it's slightly more money. I think they, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was really, really nice. But, yeah, like I say, just I would have been happy even if I never got the tick, I think, to be honest. And then now, obviously, you are pre you're pretty solid within the Twitch world. It's part of your regular thing. Is this now part of the Bilal package, the Bilal Zafa package? Will Twitch yeah. always be something you can, you will go back to? I'd like to think so. Yeah, I hope I can always do it. Even if things, even if I land some big job or something, I'd love to keep doing it because you can just do it from your bedroom. Minute. That's the that's the best thing. Any time of the day, pretty much. Um, I'd love to keep doing it. But also, like, what it gives me is like, what I've realized with the hot Pepsi, the the manager streams is like, I just get to be so creative in it in a way that you can't do anywhere else. Like I had this whole recent storyline where the gaffer, my character got a, like went to jail, uh, <laughs> had a court case. The, the whole stream was a court case. And then I did like a twist at the end where it was like, not guilty. And then the judge was like, Oh, actually I read it wrong. Guilty. And then the stream, <laughs> it just ended. Like I just raided someone and it just cut there. And I love like, I love do I do that all the time. I do loads of little twists in there and people don't know what's coming. And then I did a whole thing where the next stream, this was really meta. The next stream was all run by one of my players. Yeah. So I wasn't in it at all. Okay. So it's like, cause I'm in jail, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I get out of jail in a weird way in mysteriously. I just, I'm free suddenly. Uh, and then later, and I think people thought I'd left that all alone. But then I added another little weird twist where we signed Martins, Obafemi Martins, who's like the best <laughs> player, right? He's like, because he's too quick. Um, and then I did it. Uh, yeah, I added a little thing where stream was all great. We won some games. He'd been scoring. And then right at the end of the stream, he says to me, um, now's your time to start like talking. Like, But what well, basically the twist is that I got out on because uh what what do you call it i'm uh i'm an informant i'm an fbi informant now <laughs> and martins works with the fbi which uh that's that was the thing so that's a new and it's like all of this stuff is like it's really funny to me and it's, it's like normally <laughs> oh cheers yeah normally like stuff like this like you'd have to write it all up and it takes like months and months of development and and also no one would ever nothing like hot pepsi is ever going on tv anyway mm. There's nothing like that. I even try, I'm in the process of pitching a version of it to TV and I'm, I don't know, the initial signs, I'm, I'm not confident just because there's nothing like it, you know? Yeah. And is that why you enjoy Twitch? So literally you can have uncensored, uh, literally you're unfiltered. You can just do whatever you want, whatever pops into your mind. You can just literally put it on Twitch. Exactly. Yeah. And I've had some really, apart from that, I've done, apart from, like the Pez stuff. I've done stuff like um, I made a song for the Euros for England for 2020. Um, I did, uh, what was the other thing? I I, I've, I did like my own version of the John Lewis Christmas advert with stock footage. <laughs> and it's like, it's just, it's really fun to create something on stream. And you have like the audience, like, you know, they're encouraged to like, give me ideas and like help. Um, and I think that's the collaborative thing of it is really fun. Because if it was just... You know, like if it was just a YouTube video, I, that'd be great as well. But I love that people can be involved in that way live. Mm. It's all happening live. And then they're, they're there from like the start to finish of that little project. And then it becomes a thing. And then sometimes if the video goes a bit viral as well, that's a bit of a bonus. Um, yeah, it's just very fun. Well, I want to talk and bring you back then into your comedy start. Now, what got you started into comedy? So I... Um, I wanted to 
I've always so I, I've got two older brothers. They are seven and nine years older than me. So like since I was little, they've watched like good comedy. They they had watched like good stuff on TV because they were teenagers, and I guess it was cool to watch the good stuff. So all like I don't know like Alan Partridge, Chris Morris stuff. You know, just like all the legendary, because we had so much good British TV in like the nineties and early two thousands. So I was exposed to that from a younger, even stand up. Like I'd seen a lot of stand up when I was like like eight years old or something, oh, wow. you know, which a lot of people, I think a lot of my friends at school didn't even really know what it was. Like even stuff like Richard Pryor, I'd seen, I, even though I didn't understand some of it, but some of it was still very funny, even if you're little, like some of it's just brilliant. So I always kind of knew about it. And then I wanted to, I decided when I was like, uh, what was I like 16 or something? I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. Like there was nothing that really appealed to me and I hated school as well. And I wanted to be some kind of writer. I wanted to, I love doing like media studies because we were, mm. even though people really look down on that subject, but I, that's where I was most creative. Um, just making stuff with my friends. We got to make little short films and things. That was it. That was huge for me. So I went off to uni, did like a media degree. Um, and then you realize that that doesn't mean you get a media job at all. That usually means you get a retail job. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, and then oh, it's oh. just like, you what? No, so yeah, I did video production at, at yes. university and I was very, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? The way they sell it to you on the open day is not, it's not fair, is it? <laughs> they lie, uh, they lie. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, I had a thing where like, I thought, okay, I want to be like a behind the scenes kind of writer guy on some comedy thing. And I tried a few things and sent them around and nothing was really... It just felt like uh, nothing was ever going to happen like that. So I just, it clicked for me that I should just be saying stuff on stage. It's like, I guess it's a bit like Twitch in that way, where it's just like, if, if I had a gig tonight, for example, I could come up with an idea now and say it tonight. You know, there's no approval process or anything. It's just like, it's just that easy. Mm. Cut out any middleman. And yeah, so I gave that a go. And then I did, like I said, I worked in the care home for a bit and I did a bunch of terrible jobs and kept doing open mics absolutely exhausting 7 a.m starts and then late you know i was living in manchester and i'd like i'd have a gig in like liverpool which is not too far but then you'd get back really late and then i'd have the an early shift and that kind of thing um so i just worked really hard at it and then luckily things went my way like you say in, in 2016 where i got a couple of award type things in these comedy competitions then the edinburgh fringe did my first show and it went amazing yeah, so it was. It's it's it's. I've been really lucky. It's been it's been nice how it's happened because I know I know a lot of comedians and I know that it can be very very difficult. You know. So when you make the decision to become a comedian and you tell your family, so being of Asian heritage, yeah, I know myself. There are certain pressures. You know, doctor, lawyer, <laughs> accountants. So yeah. when you say that, look, I want to be a comedian, or or you fall into comedy and you say this is what I'm doing, what's the mm. reaction from the people around you? So. I think my dad first found out because one of his friends told him I was doing it because one of his <laughs> sons found out. I know it's weird, isn't it? No, no, no. Um, I, I can identify. You know, you know, you know the zigzag, <laughs> the Asian, like the Asian community, yeah. <laughs> the Asian whispers, yeah. <laughs> gossiping. Yeah. Um, so they they were never like the thing is though I wasn't ever like sitting at home doing nothing mm. and then going off gigging. I wasn't like that. I was all, I always had day jobs and I was doing stuff. And I, I was doing all right, you know, I wasn't really making any money, but like I was busy with stuff. Um, and I did I did some like some new act competition thing where it's just like one night where you do like everyone does like five minutes and they pick the best person. And I managed to win that like really early on, which gave me a big confidence boost. So it's like little things like that were going OK for me. So I think it wasn't too bad. You know, it's not like and also my I think my mum was mostly concerned that I was going up being like crass and swearing and stuff which i don't really do anyway mm. um and then eventually i got to do these like i used to do these like muslim charity gigs and then my parents came along to one and it was fine you mm. know it was quite good um so it was all right it, it went it went fine like i think if i approached it differently and i was like yeah i'm just gonna sit at home and live in my parents house and do nothing and then go off and do these gigs. I think it'd be very different. But like I said, because I was keeping busy. And then, yeah, and I didn't I didn't tell them. It's not like I said, I want to be a comedian. And I'm going to start now. I just got, I, I think I do that anyway. I just get on with things. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. They weren't disappointed. 
<laughs> That's a positive. <laughs> so going forward, I want to know about your comedy writing process. So mm -hmm. you have a show. Let's start the early days to begin with. How did you decide what you're going to put together in, for instance, a five minute package? It's quite hard to remember. So it was a while ago. But it's just initially because you just have to do five minutes on stage. So you're just writing what you think is five minutes of jokes. I mean, really, I think when I look back, I don't think I'd written any jokes, really. I think it was all like premises because I didn't quite sort of know how to do it yet. And a lot of it, I think a lot of the thing with going on stage is it's like sometimes the material doesn't even have to be like incredible. I think it's like your persona and stuff is what can sell it. And I think quite early on, like I've got this thing where I always, I have a naturally like kind of a downbeat persona, like kind of monotone. And that never served me well in like school and jobs. People were always like, cheer up, what's wrong with you kind of thing, even when I was fine. <laughs> but like on stage, people are like, it comes across as very wry and like relaxed. That's what they always call me, which is quite nice. And I think it's because I seem quite calm on stage and like I know what I'm doing. I think that goes a long way because uh, some people seem quiet. I guess people can seem aggressive or like a bit nervous and stuff. And it's not always very warm to watch. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, gradually you just you just start to eventually develop things that are more like jokes. Still probably a bit crap, but make people laugh in it. Um, yeah. And then and then it's just the more you go on stage, the better you get. I think I think it's like anything. It's like the main thing is practice of the actual thing rather than me sitting down and just typing away. That could be useless because you never know what actually works till you get up there. Uh, so normally, like how I work now is I never some people write out full routine like an essay. I don't do that. I just write bullet points and I know and I figure out where the joke is. And then it kind of works itself out on stage. It's quite. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's how I work best. I think something I love about stand up is like how there's no set way to do it. You just do it your own way. Because um, like I say, I hated school. I hated like doing essays and not knowing how to do stuff. If yeah. you know what I mean, it used to always frustrate me. Um, and now it's like I just have my way to do it and I make a living off it. You know, yeah. <laughs> so in relation to stand up, I always find that sometimes the joke doesn't even have to be funny. It's the delivery of it. Yeah. And is that something that identifies with you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think something I have, I, I think I'm quite good with delivering um, jokes in a certain way. Like, for example, like I've seen comedians who absolutely sh scream into a microphone and stuff. And I think it's much funnier to do it much more understated. So, like, for example, I have a new little routine now about how, this is a true story, about how a guy who um, I did jury duty a while ago. And genuinely, the crime was that a guy bought a fake Argos voucher and tried to use it. And that was it, right? That was what it was. And the there's a bit in the routine where I say, like, everyone in the jury was, like, saying guilty, guilty. And I said not guilty because who cares? <laughs> and that's always a good laugh, that bit. And it's like, when I wrote that initially, that wasn't intended as one of the punchlines even. But like when I just really kind of slow it down and I'm just like, because who cares? And I can say it quite softly into the mic and it's always quite, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I, I just think there's a lot more power in delivering something kind of calmly and softly sometimes. Yeah. So you're working your way through the comedy ranks or through the comedy stages and the comedy shows. You end up at Edinburgh Fringe in 2016 and you get nominated for this, uh, you know, th this award. You also win the 2016 Hackney uh, New Act Award. Mm -hmm. How did that feel to actually get there? Was that a bit of vindication? Yeah, man. Like, um, I always had a thing where <clears throat> I felt like, you know, everyone has, I think, a bit of that imposter syndrome thing. And I had that thing where I thought I'm doing. I was doing well in gigs, but I thought. I, d I thought, am I actually good? Like, mm. am I actually going to get anywhere? And then the first thing that happened was there's a a competition called the Leicester Square Theatre New Comedian of the Year. And that's like, it's tough. Like you have to go through rounds uh, and then like a semi-final, final kind of thing. And I got runner up in that. And that was like, that felt like a win, you know. Mm. And I got a 500 pound check um, for runner up. And I'd never been 
I think I was like 24. I'd never been paid, I don't think, like a, a little thing in that go. I'd never got like a big check before. And I think that felt really like, oh, I think I'm actually good at this. And then for the first time, I had reviewers and stuff saying like, oh, this guy's really good. That was great. And then shortly after, I managed to win that other one. Um, yeah, that was huge, man. It's weird because it's like, ultimately, I know now that awards and things shouldn't matter because so often it's not the best person that wins. Mm -hmm. And it could be. And even the times I've done well, there was luck on my side, definitely. Um and you know you don't do things you don't want to do the stuff for rewards that's not that's not right that's and it's very cynical like i've seen people i won't go i don't need to go into this too much but like there's things like there's trends at the edinburgh fringe like um for for a while people realized that sad shows did really really well like um a comedy show that has a very very sad bit in it and then i saw a lot of comedians forcing that in to try and get the awards and all of that stuff and that's not that's not how you want to live you know you just want to do the best you can and hopefully entertain people um yeah sorry i don't know if i went off topic no that's fine this is your interview you can talk about whatever <laughs> yeah. you want to uh but now thank you for that in relation to then some of your experiences on stage being an Asian comedian, obviously sometimes you can get heckled. Has that heckling ever gone too far? Has there ever been any racist abuse found your way? And how did you deal with that if there was? I've never had like a racist heckle, I don't think. Okay. Um, nothing that bad has happened yet. Uh, I did have ages ago. This might have been in like 2016. Oh, and I remember because it was the day after the Brexit result. Yeah. Was that 2016? Yeah, yeah. 2016. I think so. Uh, I was in like Wales porth call and uh, i did some material about i think i was doing the cake shop material maybe a bit on stage and in the interval a lady came up to me and said <laughs> it's quite weird she had a bottle of okay i think it was a bottle of like white wine but it was called red something yeah and she was saying look look it doesn't matter it doesn't matter like saying the i think the color thing i think she was saying like it doesn't matter like, you don't have to talk about it kind of thing. And then another comedian that was on that was going to be headlining called um, Gareth Richards, who's a good friend of mine, he just told her, he was like, stop, talk, go sit down, <laughs> like, which was quite nice. But, like, even that, I mean, I don't think... That was awkward, but I've not had any... I've not had anything too bad. I've had... You definitely get arseholes in audiences. Like, to be honest, it's mostly... I think a lot of people think that doing comedy is a lot of people heckling stuff. Uh, like, I think people think that happens all the time. But to be honest, it's mainly just people get very drunk and try and join in, which can be very irritating. Um, yeah, and usually it's quite easy to deal with. Like, you don't have to really slam them because it's like the situation is you could have like 100 people or whatever. And they're all angry at the one person because they're literally ruining the show for everyone else. And sometimes it can be fun to mock them and stuff. Um, but ultimately, they've kind of ruined the thing. So... Yeah, it's it's not it's yeah, it's not been too bad. Do you feel there's an expectation though when there is a heckler, for instance, for the comedian to put them in their place? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a bit of a shame. Like those, if I was to upload a video that says like comedian destroys heckler, mm. that would be my most viewed video yeah. ever on YouTube. Which is, in fact, love I, this. I might actually label this interview that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might as well. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, the people really, really love that kind of thing. Uh, there is a bit of that, but like I find that a bit like I said before, like with my demeanor being like sort of downbeat naturally, sometimes me saying anything to them is kind of funny. Mm. Like it just it just comes out as like sarcastic or whatever, whatever I'm saying, which is a bit weird. So it's yeah, yeah, it's mostly been fine. I've yeah, not had anything too horrible. I can imagine that dry humor and you just say what and people laugh. exactly <laughs> exactly yeah 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 no. um brilliant so then in relation to your that are there any other negatives of making comedy that you found um and i promise you we will start going into the positive parts of it after this i know it's all right it? I, I enjoy it um yeah i mean i guess the expectation like i said of me to do asian or Muslim stuff all the time has been really frustrating because I genuinely thought naively when I got into comedy that like if I just do well people will just give me 
good opportunities, but that's not been the case at all. Only doing Twitch and doing the Football Manager stuff has changed things a bit, and I guess I can show showing people what I can do. But yeah, being put in a box all the time has been really, really frustrating because like you get an email and it's like, oh, you're being considered for this show, and then you read on a bit and you find that it's like it's just something really weird, some like weird, like I say, cringe Asian thing. Uh, quite often not even written by Asians or anything or like or I get asked to do there was a what there was a period where I was being asked to do so much stuff on the BBC Asian network which felt really weird because it's like I don't listen to any of the music they play they talk about like Bollywood and stuff and I've got no interest in that stuff um it's all it's weird that stuff isn't it because it makes you feel like you're like not a proper Asian in a way <laughs> I've had this my whole life <laughs> yeah <laughs> so right yeah yeah no I, I agree i agree but yeah um, you were saying yeah no yeah so you have that weird feeling of you go there and you don't fit in and you feel like even the people there are like kind of looking at you like oh you're not one of us kind of thing but it's like what what am i supposed to do um so yeah there was there was a lot of um there's been a lot of that in in my comedy career um otherwise i guess i've been a bit i've found it I guess one of the disappointments has been that growing up TV comedy in the UK was like the best, mm. like you could argue like the best in the world, even, you know, it was really, really, the standard was so high. So my dream was always to get involved with that. And now it's like, I guess because of things like Netflix and streaming and whatever TV is falling away. And that's, it's really weird because like I met someone recently, I was doing something with a comedian who said like, because he was trying to do this online stuff. And uh, and I've been bitter that I've not got on TV really. But he goes on like, have I got news for you and stuff? And he says it doesn't really do a lot like in terms of ticket sales. Like it would have, like even probably 10 years ago, definitely 15, 20 years ago, you go on a show like that and you're probably going to sell so many more tickets. And now it's just people just don't watch that stuff as much. Um, so that's been a weird thing. That's been, I've been in denial about it. Like my nephew is, um, how old is he? Like 13. And he never, he knows what I do. He never, if I'm going on like live at the Apollo, he doesn't even know what that is. Mm. He, he asks how many YouTube subscribers I've got now, how many Twitch followers. And that's all he cares about. That's all that people that age care about. So it's like, that's all falling away. But then I guess at the same time, I should be happy that I am in the streaming world now with Twitch. So it's all right. But, you know. So how do you cope with that going forward? And because ultimately, I imagine when you were young, the aim was, you know, some sort of uh, TV show on the BBC, et cetera, et cetera. Is, does it change now where you're aiming towards Netflix or you're aiming towards more YouTube content? Like, does it change who you are aiming your content to? And that by content, I mean, your writing, your scripts, yourself. Yeah, a little bit, I guess. Like, um, yeah, it is a weird one, but in a way it's it's better because I'm not relying on someone else to give me an opportunity. Like a lot of the time I'm like, I'll do it myself. So like I filmed my, the show Cakes I did, which got the nomination in 2016. Hilarious, I managed by the to way. Make... Absolutely hilarious. I watched oh, it the other day. It was just, yeah, stitches. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I, um, I, I managed to make a bit of money over lockdown as a Twitch. And then I just was able to fund filming it. And I just did it myself. Uh, and it's like an investment in it long term. It's like hopefully that will bring me more sort of viewers and stuff over time, build the community up. Um, so it's like we have the ability to do that now. Like I don't have to wait around because for, for like, you know, Netflix or whatever. But definitely I do think Netflix is amazing. And like that is somewhere. Yeah, I'd like to try and get to eventually. It's very I think it's very difficult, you know, to get near Netflix at the moment. Um but yeah, I think also I think like um my the stuff I make like so pitching a TV version of Hot Pepsi on to to UK TV at the moment, and like uh there's just nothing like it, and I feel like something like Netflix or maybe Amazon Prime would be much more willing to make something a bit weird like that, mm. and like it could be short episodes. Episodes could be ten minutes. You know, you can you have like weird stuff like that on Netflix, don't you? You have like weird three part series and and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas on TV, it's very much like. If you're writing a sitcom, if it's on Channel 4, it's got to be this many minutes long to allow for adverts. It's got to be like this. You know, it's like it's so rigid, um, which is it doesn't really make sense. Right. Yeah. So does that then open up more options for you, I guess, because in a way, 
TV has never been better because, the, as in, there's never been more options in relation to television, right? With all these new streaming services, and I'm talking, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime are just off the top of my head. There's like Disney mm-hmm. Plus. There's all these other things. There's all these other stations that are making now their streaming services. I've recently found out on Sky. There's Paramount Plus. Didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> if you get Sky Cinema, it's free. I shouldn't have oh. advertised that. I'm not getting paid. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's all these there's there's all these avenues you can go down. Whereas back in the day, I guess there's probably only five channels, right? One, two, three. Yeah. One, two, central, channel four, channel five. So I mm-hmm. guess in a way, it is also an exciting time for you. I guess so. I mean, it's been it's it's been a weird sort of, uh, I don't know, six months or so because it's like my Twitch viewers have dropped because everyone's gone back to work. Mm. So people can't don't have time to watch so much. So they don't have they don't subscribe as much. So it's like less money. And also with like live comedy coming back, it's become quite difficult doing the two together. So I've been quite knackered. Um I still, I mean, I haven't, that's the thing, because I haven't got, apart from little acting jobs, I haven't got on Netflix or TV yet doing any proper comedy. So it's kind of hard for me to say. That's why, that's partly why I'm doing the Edinburgh show, for hopefully to get some more of that stuff. Um, but yeah, no, definitely. I think that, yeah, there's a lot of, I think, yeah, being able to make your own stuff and showing the world what you can do is a huge part of it. Um like so like if i was to take even even it, pitching the the hot pepsi thing was quite easy because it's like i've already made it and it has all these people that watch it and like loads of these people wearing the merch the actual shirts of pez united and stuff um it's not just an idea out of nowhere like oh here's an idea about a football manager it might work it's like no it works and it's a solid thing yeah it's a, it's yeah it's a really it's quite a unique time i think so in relation to then your comedy career, how much of it is networking? How much does that help your comedy career? It's a good question. I mean, I don't I'm not someone who does that actively. Like, um, I don't like hang around parties and try and meet people and stuff. But like I've found through Twitter I've made some very good friends. That's been really, really good. And that's usually just people that like my work, like reach out and stuff and then if it's people that i really admire i end up getting them on to my stuff which has been amazing so people like david o'doherty uh ian lee richard herring are all people that i didn't i don't think i i didn't really know them at all before lockdown and then because they saw my stuff on twitter and we got chatting and then i thought well you'd be really funny on my thing so come in and do it so like whether i could get them into a studio or just do it over twitch that's been really, really useful. I think, yeah, for me, Twitter has been the best. Twitter and Twitch for me have been have been amazing in that. Um, yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, I feel like I don't, hopefully don't have to sort of network too much because it's like if you just put out good work, people hopefully see it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then um, the last one, you, you mentioned about some of the Asian expectation jobs that you were, you were offered. So... Yeah. Is this a scenario where it's it's basically just stereotypical roles from back in the day that make Asian people look really bad? Are they the kind of roles you've been talking about that you were offered? Yeah, yeah, mainly like um, something I've talked about. So like I did, um, I did my second Edinburgh show was all about online dating, mm. and I talked about some Muslim dating apps on there a little bit. That was part of the show. But then that was the only bit that TV producers cared about. That was the bit that interested them. So then I was getting things like um, they wanted me uh, to do like a, a TV show where it would be me, like some kind of reality show where I'm trying to find a Muslim wife and my mum would be in it, approving and disapproving of these girls. <laughs> and it's like, as ba- that sounds bad already. But also they don't know my mum. Like mum... My mum isn't a comedian. <laughs> like, yeah. she's just, um, and I think what they did there was they thought, well, Ramesh. That's what I was about really to well. say. Yeah. yeah. So there's stuff like that. I've had a couple of things where I think, are they just trying to make me a new Ramesh? I, th- I think they are, I th- uh, which is weird. Yeah. You know, um, otherwise I'm trying to think there's, there's been loads like, like there's been, I've had auditions for things where again, it's just a stupid Asian character. Um, I'm trying to think of a more specific one. I had one which was like a sketch show 
where it was something about like forced marriages or something and it was like they were making a joke out of it and it was so weird it was so bad obviously it's it's pretty much always written by a couple of white guys as well posh white guys and it's it's just stuff like that i mean i i really have a thing about uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of asian comedians and i guess a lot of comedians from like ethnic backgrounds who uh will go up on stage and basically just mock their own thing like make fun of their own sort of background and it's and i've always hated that and it's like who is that even for you know because people like me aren't finding that funny it's like is it just for people that are a little bit racist like i don't you know there's 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 quite a bit of that and then i think it just that's sort of filtered through to tv stuff and like i've never been like that i just you know i try and have like integrity with that stuff um yeah I, it feels like sometimes those jokes are made to kind of like fit in if that's yeah. Cool. and yeah no I, I can understand why yeah that is frustrating mm. you, you've mentioned all this stuff do you see the industry moving forward or or is it and that's in relation to all diversity issues or is it a case mm. of there's still a lot of work to be done yeah the, I, I guess there is but like um like i say i can't I, I don't have too much. Ex I've had all these meetings and all of this stuff, but I've not actually done that yeah. much. So um, I do think it is getting better, though, because it's like everyone's aware now of like how little representation there's been. And I think people are getting more and more opportunities. People are getting or like there's more like commissioners and stuff from diverse backgrounds. And like I think gradually, I think even in like 10 years, I think things could be like a lot better. Um. Yeah, there is. There is still a long way to go. I mean, even stuff like um, I have a I have a lot of auditions for like sitcoms, like to play small characters in sitcoms, and I've realised a pattern of like, it's basically a lot of these new sitcoms. Um, or this was a few years ago. Excuse me, fully white cast, but then they seem to try and put diversity into it by like filling in all the small characters with like so like i went i don't know i went in for like some guy who like is like a therapist or something in one of these sitcoms and then i i look around and it's just it's like just asian and black men there so it's like so they've decided we want an asian or a black man just to play it's weird isn't it mm. um oh but there is one good thing like um in fact i think all three of the very small acting jobs i've had have have been um, colorblind castings, which means that you can be anyone, pretty much, right? I think you can even be like um, any gender or whatever. Uh, and that feels really good because then I feel like I just get, they just like me and I just get to do a good job. It's not like, oh, we need someone who looks this way, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do, I yeah, I do think stuff. I, I think overall it is, I am positive about it. Yeah. Because I feel like, being an Asian person, you don't want to be given a role just because you're Asian. You also still want that vindication of being really good at your job and you've yeah. earned that as well. And I think at times it can be a case of people positioning you in certain places because it fits, mm. but that does nothing for you as an individual, as somebody who wants to earn your place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of people say that as well. There's a lot of like jealousy, I guess. And they assume that if a brown person has a good thing, it's because you're brown. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you um, met the diversity quota. Yeah. And I've not, ex I'm pretty sure I've not experienced any of that myself. I'd like to. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like Football to comedy given. show in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, so, yeah. So have you got anyone you can speak to about that kind of stuff though? So who can say like, this is how it was, this is how it's moved forward, this is where we're going into the future. So probably pe people who've uh, been comedians before you, you know any of the of the previous generation so to speak i mean i don't really too much it's like it's all a bit random this stuff it's like I, I guess with comedy it's like there's a basic structure in place where it's like generally you do five minute open mics then you progress to doing 10 minutes on like a eventually on like a professional show so it's like you'll have a professional MC opener headliner and then in the middle you'll have two newer acts doing 10 minutes and that's really good because that's like a proper that can be a big paying audience you know and then eventually you get to do the opening 20 minute spots and then you'll get to headline some gigs you know and it's like okay that's in place for that but then when it gets to TV it's just all it's all random mm -hmm. you know it's like the way people get stuff um 
and I've had like I don't know like I speak Imran Yusuf is one comedian I know quite well and like I've spoken to him about stuff and he like it was so different when he was coming up like for one thing there weren't that many Asian comedians at the time like even now like there's more than ever but like there wasn't for a while you know that's why things like goodness gracious me or whatever was such a huge deal because there just wasn't that none of that stuff existed so it's like me and him have existed in completely different worlds by him being i don't know if he's done comedy for 10 years more than me or something mm. but it's a it's a huge difference yeah now things move on really quickly don't they um and then in relation to you then have you ever experienced a bit of writer's block and how did you deal with that yeah it happens it, it happens all the time really it just i i don't have a system of writing really it's just kind of random i just jot ideas down whenever uh i find that um going for a walk somewhere i never just go for a walk i go and buy something i don't need yeah. you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no whoever just you know no one ever just goes <laughs> for a walk you have to buy something you know? um i i listen to music i find listening to music very very helpful um and i listen to all sorts of different from like a, a lot of hip-hop and a lot of like indie stuff and rock music whatever like all sorts of stuff and i don't know i think i think it doesn't like it's not like it directly influences you but i think it just like calms your mind a bit and you stop stressing out and uh yeah but for me writing is a very gradual thing it's not like i sit down and i'm like okay writing session and then i like knock out loads of jokes it's not that at all it's like things occur to me gradually might be something i said to a friend or whatever and then that i'm like oh that works as a thing and then, yeah, I get to do these um, gigs where you just go and try stuff out. Um, yeah, I have some very nice uh, new material gigs like that where I yeah, get to give it a go. And it's fine if it doesn't work. It's kind of funny if it doesn't work at all as well. You know, it's like it's very little pressure there. Even if you completely die on your ass at one of those, it doesn't matter at all. Yeah, that wouldn't happen. But, you know, is, is that what they're designed for then? Yeah, so it's like, yeah, for, for the comedians to go up, do 10 minutes each of newer bits. And, you know, it's it's great because a lot of the, like, the old tickets are never very expensive for those, probably like a fiver or something. Um, and you will see a good show. It's like, it's not going to be awful. Cause these are all professional, good comedians, usually. Um, yeah, those are, those are really, really useful, those gigs. Yeah. Has there ever been a time where, during your comedy career, you felt, Am I good enough? Can I do this? Where you've doubted yourself? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the thing. Like when you read out my little credits at the start, it all just sounds perfect. Mm. Like I've just been doing fine. But that's all PR, isn't it? Like it's a bit like when you look at someone's Instagram, and you just see all the them on holiday and them getting a new job, and you don't see all the other stuff that they're dealing with. You know, it's a bit like that. Like um, basically, I had the 2016 success, and then gradually it was less and less. Like. Um, less reviewers and all the people that give out awards and stuff they were just not as interested uh and that felt really really bad and then at the same time i wasn't getting the tv work i wanted got close i kept getting close to things and then not getting it which is quite crushing you know especially when it's a big it feels like it's something that might change your life you know uh that kept happening and then yeah around that time i just thought because you don't know in it like even though you can go up on stage every night and, and do really well, just think well, maybe I'm not actually that good then if everyone else is getting stuff, um, which is why something like Twitch has been amazing because I get to go on and do all my own stuff. And it just gives me a huge confidence. I mean, it's helped with the, co I think it's helped a lot with stand up because it's given me a lot of like self-confidence that I didn't quite have. Like before you'd, you know, you'd write a thing and you'd be like, oh, I don't know if this works, but now it's like, because I go on Twitch, especially when I do the hot Pepsi thing, and it's like, it has to be funny. It, above everything, it's a comedy stream, really. It's like a comedy show. And it's like, I can't test this material out anywhere. It just has to work. And like, so these funny ideas, I just have to have the confidence in them to know, right, that's funny, that's funny. And then I kind of have that going up on stage now, where it's like, well, I know this is funny, you know? Whereas before, I didn't quite have that same attitude to it. I was, I was a lot more, I think, sort of, cagey and like careful about taking any risks you know in relation to your comedy then and and just stick to the comedy part please when you are having those moments of self-doubt and that anxiety and 
does that creep in? And then how do you, who's around you? What's your network like to try and help you through that? Because you said after the 2016, and, and it is when I was looking at your awards and stuff, and then there was nothing at all 2020 in relation to the Joe Online Comedy Award. And mm-hmm. I did wonder, I, I know obviously a lot's happened since then, and, and you're still working, but it's not going as, you know, it's, it's not the linear approach of success, is it? Or, or what people say, because mm-hmm. none of this is linear. Yeah. So what's, what's the mindset like? Who's helping you? I mean, it is something about comedy is it is it can be quite a lonely job because you are, especially if you're doing like if you're doing a little tour and you're just going around the country doing these shows in like Swindon or whatever, and it goes really bad. You just kind of have to sit with it. Like I had it actually recently where um, I had a show in Hastings where it was a preview. So like me testing out the new show and like there was no technician. There was supposed to be a, te- a tech guy helping. He just didn't show up. So like the mic didn't work or anything. And it was a complete mess. And then it didn't sell as well as I would have liked. And I got I got really depressed by that. Like I got, I don't know what it was. I think I was just really tired. And like, I was just feeling like about my thing. I was like, nothing's ever going to sort of work out. Just got quite miserable. Just, you know, told a couple of friends I was feeling that way. Chatted about it a little bit, but it doesn't massively help. But then the great thing about comedy is I had another gig. I had like, two other gigs like a couple of days later or even maybe even the next night so you don't have time i did actually i did have a gig the next night and that was the uh, complete opposite that was like a huge packed hall with like 200 people it was amazing um and then you forget that very quickly and then oh and then i did i think and then a couple of nights later i did richard herring's podcast which is like one of my favorite I'd listened to that like before I even started stand up. So that was a huge deal for me. And that went really nicely. Yeah. And then you feel a lot better. I think it's, yeah, I think the great thing about it is, is that you just, you have to go up and on stage again. Like everyone has bad gigs, which I, I didn't realize that when I started, I thought like all my favorite comedians were just perfect all the time, but every single comic will have bad gigs, but then yeah, you've got to just do it again. You don't have time. You don't have time to feel sorry for yourself really, which is great. Yeah. You mentioned favorite comedians. I want to know who are the comedians you actually look up to yourself, um, if not now because you're in the industry, maybe just when you were starting or as you've gone on. So I mentioned that it sounds kind of hack saying Richard Pryor because it sounds like such an obvious one, but we did actually, you know, we had like I think it's like a DVD that came free with something when I was I was quite young that I watched a few times. Uh, I used to really love Dave Chappelle as well. Mm. He's got a couple of, I don't, I don't love him as much right now, but like I, I used to love his, before he was this super famous guy. Um, I think the early two thousands. He's got two stand up specials out. He put put two out, which I think are both on YouTube, and I used to love those. And I think I think he influenced me a lot. He's like because what he does is it's very calm storytelling, you know, which he's very good at. It's very very funny. Um, and people look at, uh, you know, I, th- I think people get a bit too excited about when a comedian is too like animated and stuff. Like, I don't know, someone like Kevin Hart, who's very good as well, but his thing relies a lot on his delivery. Mm. Whereas with Chappelle, it's like a lot, I don't know. It just seems a lot more. Yeah. A lot calmer. Um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who else I liked someone I really loved actually someone who, um, when I was probably like 18 or what, I don't know, like 21, when I, I was having thoughts like I want to do stand up and then, but I felt a bit like, because there were people like Mac, Michael McIntyre and stuff on TV at the time who were very, very energetic. And I thought I'm not like that. But then I watched uh, Simon Amstel. Hmm. He had, he probably, you know, him from like, he presented Nevermind the Buzzcocks a while ago and stuff. Um, he had a special out called Do Nothing, I think. Yeah. And he's like not slick at all, but he's so funny. Yeah. And then when I saw that, I was like, oh, man, I could absolutely do this. You know, that really, really helped. And now who do I like? Like uh, Maria Bamford is an American comedian. I think she's really, really interesting. Um, uh, what's his name? John Mulaney, I think, is like really, really good. And yeah, I don't know. There's a few others. I should really have like a list ready. <laughs> when you come yeah, because that's yeah, that's yeah. a common question, right, for podcasts. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> um, no, but. Then in relation to, I just want to, 
your personality are you a reflector do you reflect a lot on the past past shows jokes or is it a case of it's happened i've dealt it's happened whatever's happened has happened i'm going to be very much in the moment I guess I think a bit of both like um, I do think it's really really useful to I mean like some people like record every gig they do and listen back and take notes and I don't do that I can't bother to do that but like there's definitely times when like so even like for example I'd, so this gig I mentioned in Hastings where like none of the tech worked and it was like a bit of a mess I've had that happen before so um, but when it first happened I was completely rattled by it and I like didn't know what to do and I forced myself to do some stuff but like I didn't realize at the time like it doesn't matter the audience are gonna enjoy it just make them enjoy it it doesn't you know so like now I can deal with I guess just through practice you can deal with these situations better right um yeah so I do definitely like I so if this is the thing as well like I think not just with comedy but I guess with everything like the fact is it's the bad experiences that you learn from, you know, like if I was doing gigs and like, it was all just easy forever and everyone loved everything I did, I would not grow as a comedian at all. You just wouldn't improve, would you? And it's like that with anything, which is a shame because it can be really tough to take when things go bad. But like, yeah, I think I've, I think I've done well to, I do, I do reflect. And I think I have, yeah, learned like, okay, going forward, I'll play it like this and I'll do this. Um, yeah, there's there's so many variables with comedy. It can, it can be so different. Um, but yeah. And then how do you switch off from creating content? Because you're creating comedies, you're, cre- you're creating sitcoms or pitching things, you're creating Twitch contents. Obviously, if you create too much or, or if you're constantly thinking about stuff, you can burn out, you can burn yourself out. What do you do to switch off if anything. Well, this was a problem for me, man. The burning out was a serious, like, that was really bad. <clears throat> I burnt out, like, three or four times in the last couple of years so badly. Like, I can't do anything anymore. So I've struggled with that because it's like, I just get excited about new ideas, isn't it? And then, and then you just want to develop a new thing. Um, I found it really hard. What I try to do now is I try and be more careful with like a schedule. So like even with streaming, I sort out what my schedule is at the start of the week and it's usually Monday to Friday. And I've got to give myself, like I try and give myself at least one day off where I'm not doing any, even replying to emails and stuff. Like I have to do that because you forget that even doing that bit of admin is work mm. and that still kind of melts your brain. Um, yeah, so I just have to be more careful. But because it's bad. And I spoke to, um, I, I've got a lot of really good friends now who do a lot of, since doing Twitch, I've met so many people that are working constantly. And I've spoke to them about it. And they're like, you know, all they say is like, oh, be careful. Because I know, I know people that have had like full mental breakdowns and stuff from overworking. Which, I mean, it must sound stupid. People listening to this who have like proper jobs. It must sound really dumb, but it's, it is tough. No, but like... I always say that everything's perspective, right? And and ultimately, yeah. people think that the finished product is what you see on camera, on stage, etc. But the amount of angst, the amount of work, the amount of you're thinking about it nonstop. As somebody mm. who's had this podcast, so just before we were starting, I was thinking nonstop about your introduction. I want to nail this. I want to make yeah. sure everything's perfect. You're my first non-football manager related content creator i want to expand the scouting center podcast so cool. you know all the little things you're thinking i spend a day emailing loads of people would you want to be a guest on like there's a lot of work that goes on behind the finished product and then you put out the finished product you're happy with the finished product but then you got the reviews what do people yeah. think what's it it's a constant cycle it, it in between your own four walls so in your brain a constant cycle so that in itself is taxing so Mm -hmm. i feel that the appreciation isn't there for creators as much not from everyone but the amount of work that's involved because everyone says dream job but you any money you're putting in 12 hours a day minimum most Mm. days where you're thinking about this dream job and you're working hard to put it down on paper etc that's the thing. And I've realized this recently, actually, that even when I used to do like care work and stuff, um, which was really exhausting, like at least I was working for those hours and then I was done with it. 
and then I did my own thing. And it's like now that doesn't happen. It's like you're constantly obsessing. And it's like for me now, life is like gigs, streams, auditions, meetings, writing stuff. Um, that Yeah, that kind of thing. And it can get very busy in a week. You could have if I've got like four gigs in a week but then I need to do certain streams as well. Cause like the hot Pepsi stream, I need to try and do it on a Monday night. That's mm. when, that's when it is. And I need to, you know, even if I'm really tired, I've got to try and make sure I do it. And that in itself, even doing that street, cause I'm in character the whole time. It feels like I've done a whole show afterwards. Like I'm knackered finishing that every time, which is good. I love it, but yeah. Cause your hot Pepsi streams are how long compared to your shows? Uh, a hot Pepsi is usually about two hours. Mm. Yeah. Um, obviously it's not quite the same as doing a live show, but it is keeping everything going, especially when it's a big, when I'm not just playing the game and it's like a big storyline kind of weird stream yeah. that can be, yeah, it's exciting, but yeah, it can be exhausting. And then let's talk about some of your, well, your acting break when you no acting training, right? You get yeah. a role in last Christmas with obviously it stars, the lead characters are, well, two of them are Emma Thompson and Amelia Clark. How did you get that role? And yeah, what did it mean to you? Oh, I mean, it, it was weird. Like, so a lot of comedians, I think, just get to audition for stuff. Uh, I'm very lucky my management have that going on. So I can, you know, I am on a spotlight, which is the acting thing you have to be on, uh, which costs like 200 quid a year. So, you know, um, so I'm on there. I get to go for these castings and I've, you know, mostly... I think I've well, I really put the work in now, but a lot of them I just didn't do very well at. Like I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't realize like when you read a line, you're supp after that you're supposed to be reacting to the other person saying something. You're not supposed to be thinking about the next thing. Looking, you know what I mean? Like it's these little things I just didn't think about. Um, but it's not. I mean, yeah, it's. I guess uh, when you do it a bit, you get used to it and it gets kind of fun. But like, yeah, sorry, the um the last Christmas audition was literally I had to go in and react to my fish dying. That's what it was. And that's all I did. And I was like, well, that's an afternoon, you know, carried on. And then a few days later, I got a call and they were like, yeah, you, they want you in that. And I was like, yeah, I couldn't believe it. Especially I was going through a difficult time. Like I mentioned with the, the way comedy was going, I was a little bit down with everything. And then out of nowhere, oh, you're just going to be in a film with Emma Thompson. It's like, it's really, it's really weird, this sort of career. Um, yeah, no, it was amazing, man. It's like, I know, the thing is, because like, I, I go on about it all the time and I'm barely in it. Like, if you watch it, you'll probably miss me. But I'm in three tiny bits. I think I say, like, two words. But the whole experience, like, even if I don't ever do another film, it was just, like, it was so nice. Like, the director's uh, Paul Feig, who did, like, Bridesmaids and, like, some, like, yeah. legendary films like that. He's really, really good. And he's a really nice guy. And he stayed in touch with me as well, which, like, he didn't have to do. Um... When you, Emma Thompson is like how you would expect her to be. You know, obviously a lot of, you hear a lot of people might be a little bit off, a bit rude or something in real life. She's lovely. She's so nice. And she knew my name. Like I went, first day I went in to have like the hair and makeup. He was there getting her hair done. And she just knew, she like put her hand out. She knew my name and she was like, oh, I loved your tape. And it's like, I think she's just very like, very kind and familiar with everyone. But it means a lot, man. Yeah. It really does. She didn't even have to look at me. And it would have been fine, you know? Um, yeah, the whole experience was, like, absolutely amazing. The way you get treated as an actor is weird, how well they treat you compared to comedy. Like, literally, I've been in dressing rooms where there's no heating. And I've been in my coat <laughs> backstage waiting to go on, you know? It's like that. And then the difference is you get picked up from home in a fancy car, taken to, like, a very nice trailer, brought food. They're like, do you need anything else? You know, um, I was staying in a... In a, so because it was filmed in London and they don't have they couldn't put trailers up like they usually would because yeah. it was around Central, so they put me in a hotel as my sort of trailer. But I've never been to a place like that. Honestly, the the my hotel room was like a flat. Wow! Like it was massive. It was so big. The TV had Sky Sports on it, which you don't usually get in a hotel. No. Nope. <laughs> nope. So I was watching. So that morning I was sitting there having breakfast after just meeting Emma Thompson. And I was watching like one of those Sky Sports, like all the best goals in like 2003 or whatever. <laughs> and I was just like, this is the best time of my life. Yeah. You know? You could get used to this. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, but that's why. But this is the thing, isn't it? This is why a lot of actors turn into like divas because you get treated too. It's too nice. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, I loved it. So from that, then did any of the opportunities turn up, or was it a case of was it just one and done? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I've had. I get loads of good auditions and uh, I've not been, I'm not at the level to be approached, I guess, for anything and just, no one's come to me and said, be in our thing. Mm. Nothing that's like a big paid thing anyway. Um, hopefully that will happen one day, but I'm happy. I, I enjoy the auditioning process, to be honest. Um, I got a few more good castings. I don't know if it was off the back of that. I got, man, it's like, it's so frustrating. Like I got, um, Riz Ahmed was doing some film uh about his life or something and i auditioned to play his cousin in the film and that would have been great you know yeah. uh but then i got i did the first audition they loved it and then i went in and met the director and read with him and i knew i didn't nail it you know i could tell and also they changed the script because this is the thing this is where lack of training i guess and, and that comes in because like they changed the script mm. and I wasn't prepared for it. And I, so I was kind of looking down and like the, in one before I had like a wife and now in the new scene, I did, I was like single and it was like all different. Um, and I was a bit like rattled by it. And then, so I didn't get it. And I thought, Oh, I was so, so close to getting another film role, but yeah, you know, it's all right. Is that the biggest opportunity that you've had or that you've, you know, you've been so close mm. But just, but just not cross the line, or, or is there another one? Something that you thought? Oh, there's if been a I few. If I get this, I've made yeah. it. I mean, I, to be honest, I guess I've not had anything. You never know, in it. You never know if you've made it in any way. Like, you know, because I also films flop as well quite often. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. I could get uh, a big role in a new big film and it could just be a huge failure like that that's the thing it's like i don't think anything is quite like that right i had and I, also i'm never really going for the main character i'm fine being a side character honestly like it's okay um i'm trying to think what else i mean i i get i've had a lot of good castings for like like some big like hollywood films which i, have, I haven't got either um but i keep doing i like i auditioned for the new barbie film um, not long ago and I tried so hard like I practiced for ages and like you know really thought I'd got it down and then you just don't don't hear anything back and it's like that could be a little bit annoying but at the same time just the fact that I get the opportunity you know I have to keep reminding myself like just the fact that you could have even done that is like mad yeah. you know no that's pretty amazing to be fair as we start wrapping up this interview Bia, I just want to ask mm -hmm. you what are your personal goals of the next 12 months and where would you like to see yourself in the next 12 months? That's a good question. I mean, I'd get, I'd like to keep making more and more stuff like I'm doing. Um, I'd like to make more money. That's the thing. I have found that to be honest, that's not been great. I mean, I've got, so I've got this new Edinburgh show I'm working on. Yeah. I'd like that to be a big hit. And I'd like to take that to tour around the country and it needs to do well in Edinburgh if it's going to, sell tickets because i'm not you know a celebrity um yeah i mean that's it really i'd like i i would love some kind of tv work which i'd love to do some stand-up on tv it's not impossible i'm kind of hoping that's what the edinburgh show leads to so yeah i mean yeah for the next 12 months i mean something else i'd like to do as well maybe not in the next 12 months but i'd like to write and direct a film like a feature film I'd love to do that one day. So I guess if I'm just getting closer to that position, I'd be quite happy. You know, there's not there's not like one thing that I feel like I desperately need. Yeah. No, that's great to hear. And it's nice that you you work towards your goals and you can see the progress. Mm. Tell me more then about what people can expect from your Edinburgh fr um, Fringe show, Care, that's coming out. I think it's uh, mid-August, is it? No, it's the, I think it's from the 3rd to the 26th or something. Oh, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, so from the 3rd yeah. of August to the 26th of August. Tell us what people can expect. Uh, it is a... Um, I think it's a very funny, like, storytelling stand-up show. Um, yeah, like, the fact that it tells a story... For me, like, that's my favourite kind of comedy when you're kind of being taken on a journey rather than joke, joke, joke. Uh, so I think it's... Um, 
yeah, no, I think it'd be really fun. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I think I think it's very funny. I I just I think it's a good show. I think I think it's going to be really good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, brilliant. No, thank you so much, Blair. I appreciate you so much for coming on the Scout Center podcast. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed getting to speak to you a bit more, and it's, it's I'm really looking forward to seeing your show um, at the Edinburgh Fringe. Care obviously coming up between in August, so make sure you guys check it out. Mm-hmm. Thanks so much for having me. No. That's been really nice. Well, viewers, I hope you enjoyed this. Like I said, my first, the Scouting Center podcast is going different places now, the broader term of creator, not just football manager, content creator. I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on any of the audio platforms, leave this the five-star review and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.